Welcome to the house. Um, won't you come and stand and sing with us? And if you're at the coffee shop, come and grab a seat and let's worship. darkness, my God, that 
Well, welcome everyone. So good to be together and worship the Lord together at the house. We're so glad that you're here. And uh, we realize that when you come to church and just, just to be here tonight for some of you is a real big step. And uh, we come from all different kind of stories and backgrounds and experiences. And we know that within a community like this, there are times you might come on a Sunday night and you're so looking forward to it. Maybe you feel like, I just got to get there. I, gotta, I just want to worship the Lord. I want to be with my friends. Others may feel like it was a real stretch, maybe even a battle, maybe a struggle for you to be here. Maybe you're here and you're not even really sure why you're here or what we're singing about or what's going on. And, uh, and you know, there have been people praying for each one of you all week. And we would believe that Jesus is alive, that Jesus is real, and that you're here tonight for a purpose. You're here tonight for a reason, and that Jesus would meet with you, and he's got a word for you. He's got something for your life. And uh, regardless of what has been going on in your life and why you feel you're here, we believe that you're here because the Lord has something for you. And uh, that's something that each one of us can experience. And so we're so glad to have you join us tonight. And as we step into worship, as we step into singing and thinking about Jesus over the next couple minutes, we know that part of what we encounter and part of what we experience comes out of an open heart, comes out of just uh, opening our own lives and our, op our own stories towards Jesus. And so we want to just open tonight with just a moment of prayer and just as an invitation for you to join in to invite Jesus to meet with us, to speak with us, to be present with us, knowing and trusting that he's good and that he's got something in store for us. Why don't you join in with me as we pray together as a community? Jesus, we give you the next few moments. There are so many things that are trying to get our attention, so many things looking for our attention. But Jesus, we want to give you our attention. We want to give you our affection, our adoration. We want to focus on you for the next few minutes. I thank you for every life that is here, for every heart that is with us tonight. And that, Jesus, you would meet with every person. There would be something. You would whisper something into every person's heart tonight. And so we give you the moments ahead. We make space tonight for you. And if there would be some here that feel perhaps far from you, maybe they're even wondering in their heart what they're doing here and what's going on and what's being spoken about, Lord, I pray that you would just reveal yourself to them. And we give you the moments ahead in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're so glad you're here. The team is going to continue to lead us in worship. Trust that you'll just be at home and enjoy the presence of Jesus as we worship together.
speaks to the faithfulness of Jesus, the faithfulness of God to always show up when we need him time and time and time again, that he is our champion. He's the one that goes ahead of us and fights the battle and wins it, and then we get to walk in it. You are my champion, giants fall when you stand up. Defeated every battle you've won. I am who you say I am. You crown me with confidence. I am seated in the heavenly place, undefeated with the one who is calm. tried so hard to see it, took me so long to believe it, that you choose someone like me to carry your victory. Perfection could never Battle you 
Becomes my 
And Jesus, as we're in this moment, I pray for those that may feel like they're struggling, maybe discouraged tonight, maybe they're in a, a difficult moment. And Jesus, I pray that you would strengthen them, you'd lift them up. Thank you that you even led them tonight to join us, to be a part of us tonight. And in a world that's kind of going crazy and there's all kinds of fear and things happening, Jesus, we choose to anchor ourselves to you. We choose to put our hope in you and our trust in you. And Lord, I pray that you would show up in our heart, even, even those that maybe tonight are still uncertain. Jesus, I pray that you would show up in our lives. We put our hope and our trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, team, for leading us tonight. Why don't you grab a seat? And uh, so glad that you're here with us. My name is Chad, and I get to be the lead pastor. And uh, we're live streaming tonight. And so we do have some people who are watching us at home and uh, maybe their workplaces, uh, maybe studying tonight. And they've got us on in the background. So it's great to have you join us. And uh, just a reminder for uh, the rest of us uh, that we do meet during the week. And uh, there are different things that happen in our community throughout the week. Uh, there is the the student lounge. It happens on Monday and Tuesdays. We've got our food bank. You can even access that tonight if you're interested. Uh, if you're on the dorms, we do our Tuesday night shuttle runs for groceries, uh, grocery runs, and uh, student lounge. It's open on Monday, Tuesday. You can study, and coffee shops open. There's free laundry, and uh, just some ways we can kind of connect with you and, and uh, include you into uh, different areas of, uh, of our community. There's a few other things happening that are within the, the Sunday night kind of specific community that we want to let you know that are happening. We do our bi-weekly Tuesday it's a, it's a connect group, more of a small group Bible study. That happens on every second Tuesday. It's happening this week, Tuesday, 7 o'clock. It's here. And also the collective, which is a, a, a loose young adult kind of, well, that doesn't, that doesn't sound right to say a loose young adult community. They're um, a, a loosely organized young adult community, okay? And um, they are uh, made up mostly from people from our Sunday night community, also some other churches and, uh, and a larger, broader audience within Kelowna. And you can find the collective on Facebook. And we actually have some posters with a QR code. You can scan that even tonight on your way out with your phone camera, and, uh, and that will take you to the link. And um, if you stay connected to the collective through our Facebook group, you will be kept up to date with different events and gathering points and things that are happening. So a few weeks ago, we did a Friday night, uh, uh, Friday night skiing at Big White. And coming up this week on Saturday, downtown uh, Saturday night, there's a pizza gathering at Antico Pizza. And so again, this is just some just informal, casual gatherings. They're not super organized where you have to always sign up in advance and things like that. But it's a great way to just connect with some other people, make some friends, and uh, just do some social gatherings and connections outside of just Sunday night church. And uh, so that's a, something we encourage you to uh, follow up with and to get involved. Uh, also, if you want to give tonight in the offering, there's a couple ways you can do that. One is uh, you can do that in person here. There's the self-directed giving at the donation station. That's located underneath the Scrabble board. We also have our online giving and text-to-give options, and I encourage you to take advantage of those. And just want to say we so appreciate your generosity. Realize that even as students, you know, money can be tight, and uh, you don't always have all of the, the finances, and, uh, but we just appreciate any generosity support you're able to, uh, to uh, bring towards the church to help us be here, and uh, it's, it's always a, a great thing to participate in worship in that way. Now, we have a guest speaker with us tonight. We're uh, wrapping up our series. We've done this Jesus in series, so we had Jesus in the darkness, uh, Jesus in the wilderness, and tonight we're looking at Jesus in the storm. And so we have uh, guest speaker Matt Jaggers is going to join us in a second. And uh, I got to know Matt when we pastored together at Evangel Church a number of years ago. And uh, I've since uh, been involved here as we've led this, this church community into our own church, uh, our own autonomous church. And Matt has uh, moved on to uh, working with a ministry called Family Life Canada. And Matt is involved with helping 
uh, teach marriage mentoring, uh, marriage coaching, premarital uh, strengthening of relationships, uh, helping couples doing, uh, with, helping with re retreats, conferences, uh, mentoring groups, things like that, also helping as parents and family units, and uh, so appreciate Matt's ministry. And so I want to, uh, would you just extend a welcome to Matt as he comes tonight to share the word. Come on, Matt. Thanks, Chad. Yeah, so as Chad has mentioned, uh, working with this ministry called Family Life Canada, and we were actually, so my wife and I, we've, we're uh, celebrating 20 years of marriage this year. And I know what you're thinking, like, yeah, I know, it's pretty amazing. Uh, but you're thinking like, wow, Matt, you look so young. I know that's what you're thinking, right? And, uh, but however, we were at this church this morning, and uh, this guy comes up to, to my wife and I, and I, I sure hope he was joking, because he's like, he goes to my wife, oh, is this your dad? That's what he says to my wife. Is it? So I know, ouch, eh? So, but my wife, she does look really young. So, um, but uh, she's, she's not. I mean, she's uh, a few years younger than me, but she's not like super young. She's not like 20 or anything like that, right? So, uh, but we've been married for almost 20 years. And so we're really excited about that and really excited about being part of this new ministry called Family Life. But uh, that's not what uh, I'm going to be sharing about tonight, right? So we're, you guys, uh, we're wrapping up this theme of Jesus in. And so tonight, we're going to be looking at Jesus in the storm, all right? And uh, that's something that, uh, there's something that we all have in common, right, as individuals. Every individual before us and after us uh, and everyone here in this place has or will face difficult times, all right? So the reality is you will, I hate to break the news here, all right, you will eventually face, or if you haven't already, you will face some uh, some difficult times, whether it's financial struggles, whether it's dealing with broken relationships or unexpected situations that, that come our way, every single one of us will experience times in a storm. And uh, it'll be a storm that, that tries to disrupt, to destroy, and to bring you ruin in your life. And so the question is, what do you do in that kind of storm? And how should you react? And where is Jesus in the storm. I uh, recently moved back uh, from Saskatchewan. Any, anybody here from Saskatchewan? Any, yeah, a few people? Awesome. All right. So I just I was in Sask uh, Saskatoon for two years working at a church there. We just moved, moved, moved back in September. And so got to experience a couple of summers in Saskatoon and got to experience a summer of thunderstorms. And I don't, the thunderstorms over there seem a little bit different over here. I mean, the thunder just seems to roll on a lot longer than it does here. And, but I recall there'd be the summer evening and the, the, the day was just a beautiful day, but then all of a sudden the storm would roll in and it would just crack with thunder and there'd be lightning and, and uh, it'd be, it would shake the house. Uh, and sometimes these types of storms would bring in hail. And the hail would bring some damage to the houses. I mean, when I first moved there, everybody was getting their house, uh, all the roofs redone because of insurance, because of hail damage. Uh, sometimes uh, the storms would bring in these strong winds. And these winds would cause damage, ripping off uh, shingles off the houses or bringing down trees. And so there were some pretty incredible storms I got to witness during my time in Saskatoon. But I think the most terrifying storm that I have ever experienced was a time camping in a, in a lake, or, or on, on a lake in southern BC. And my, my family and I, we were camping right on, on the beach, and it was boat access only, and so we had, we had a boat with us. And on one of the days, we had these 90-kilometer winds come down the valley. I mean, that's it's pretty intense winds, and they're coming, and there were trees that came down. But I remember all our stuff was blowing around everywhere, and we're chasing all our stuff, trying to gather it all and put it all in a safe place. We're holding on to our tent. We're holding on to the boat as it's just crashing through the waves, and we're trying to keep it up on the shore. And there was, in fact, there was, we looked out on the lake, and the waves were just huge. Uh, and there was only one boat on the lake. And the reason why is because it had been torn off of its anchor and it was just floating aimlessly down the lake. There was nobody in the boat. I mean, they probably ended up at the bottom of the lake, I'm certain. But it was a terrifying storm. And I think storms, they can be pre unpredictable. They can be terrifying. And so we're going to look at a couple of encounters that Jesus and his disciples experienced in a storm. And so if you have your Bibles, uh, it will be up on the screen too, but we're going to look at Mark chapter 4. We're going to look at a few verses there, verses 35 
and then we're going to flip right over, and we're just going to read these two accounts back to back, all right? So you can follow along up on the screen there. So this is starting right at verse 35. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. And so they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. That sounds pretty comfortable, eh? Jesus is just sleeping there. Now, I know there was a time change last night, so I sure hope nobody's going to be falling asleep tonight here. All right. So Jesus is sleeping with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up, shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence, be still. And suddenly the wind stopped, and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and waves obey him. And then we're just going to flip over and, and read another narrative about Jesus and the disciples involved in the storm. And this is, just to give you some context, this is just right after Jesus feeds the crowd of 5,000, right? And it's actually even more than 5,000 people. But it's right after this, Jesus immediately, after he feeds the 5,000 and all that, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and head across the lake to Bethsaida. Well, he sent the people home. And then after telling everyone goodbye, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Late that night, the disciples were in their boat in the middle of the lake, and Jesus was alone on land. He saw that they were in serious trouble, rowing hard and struggling against the wind and waves. And about three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. He intended to go past them, but when they saw him walking on the water, they cried out in terror, thinking he was a ghost. They were all terrified when they saw him. But Jesus spoke to them at once, don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I am here. Then he climbed into the boat, and the wind stopped. And they were totally amazed, for they still, they were totally amazed. These are some pretty incredible encounters that Jesus and the disciples had. I mean, and these are physical storms. But we do discover some insights on how Jesus deals with storms. And this also refers to how he deals with storms in our lives. And we're going to take a look at a few uh, examples in the Gospels where Jesus interacted with people that were going through storms. But I want to ask, did you notice in both encounters, in both stories, Jesus doesn't seem too concerned about the storm? I mean, in the first account, he's sleeping He's sleeping in the boat. All the other disciples, they were all panicking, and they're terrified that they are going to drown. Now, Jesus spent the day ministering to people, and he was probably exhausted, but no doubt, so were the disciples. They would have been exhausted being around these crowds of people with Jesus, but yet they were, too con they were more concerned about what was going on with the wind and the waves and the storm. But Jesus was content just to get some sleep. In the second account, the disciples left as evening came because Jesus sent them on their way. Now, let's, we'd have to suppose that they left around 7 or 8 p.m. in the evening after they fed all the people. And Jesus took some time to go up the hill and, and take some time to pray. And then he comes back down and he notices that the disciples are struggling out on the water and the wind and the waves. And so he makes his way out to them. I mean, they're out in the middle of the lake having this struggle. I mean, they, if you think about it, Jesus arrives to them about 3 a.m. walking on water. They had been out there for at least about eight hours struggling in this storm. I mean, I think that's pretty crazy that Jesus just walked out there. And, and the crazier part is that it said, Mark, Mark says that Jesus intended to go past them. I think that's, that's just crazy. I'm thinking Jesus is just kind of walking by and says, hey, guys, hope you're having fun. I'll meet you on the other side. I'm just going to get breakfast ready, and uh, we'll see you in a few more hours, all right? Jesus stops because they are terrified. They, first of all, they, I mean, they think he's a ghost, and they scream out, and they're terrified. They're afraid in their storm. And so then Jesus stops, and he goes to them. Jesus doesn't seem to be too concerned about the storm. 
I mean, if you think about it, he could have calmed the storm even before he headed out walking on the water. But he didn't. He sees them struggling, sees them out in the middle of the, the sea, and he just makes his way out to them. And it's interesting because we do see a similar response by Jesus when he's interacting with a few people within the Gospels. There's one example is a, is a, a leader within the, the synagogue, a guy named Jairus, <clears throat> And whose daughter was sick and very close to death. And he comes to Jesus. And it says in, in, in Mark earlier in the chapter before, it, it says that he was pleading fervently with Jesus to come with him so that Jesus could heal his daughter. I mean, there's a storm that's happening within Jairus. And so Jesus says, yes, I'll, I'll go with you. And as they're walking in the crowds of people, Jesus and the disciples, there's a lady who had been sick for years, and, and she, just, she believes that if she could just touch the hem of Jesus' garment, the, just the, the hem of Jesus' robe, that she would be healed. And so she does. She reaches out, and she touches his garment, and she is healed. And, and Jesus is aware of this miracle. He's aware of what just happened. And so he stops, and he begins to have this conversation with this lady on the street. And I'm just thinking in my mind, like, Jairus, he's pleading fervently. He's begging Jesus to go with him to heal his daughter. I mean, there's a storm that's going on with him. And I just can't imagine just Jesus stopping and having a conversation with a lady and how Jairus would have been feeling. And in fact, there's a messenger that comes from Jairus' house who comes to Jesus and Jairus there and basically says, hey, listen, it's too late. Your daughter is dead. Don't bother bringing Jesus to the house. It's too late. But Jesus, his response is this. He says, you know, just, it's okay. We're, we're still going to go. Just have faith. And so Jesus arrives into this house, and, and there's already a storm happening in the house as there's people within there who are just uh, in, in, in mourning. They're in despair. And Jesus walks in, and, and he asks, well, what's going on? And they're upset because the, the daughter died. And Jesus simply responds, she's just sleeping. And they all laugh at him. And, and so then he just asks them to leave. And he goes in, and he heals Jairus' daughter. There's a storm that was happening in Jairus' life. Jesus didn't seem to respond to the storm, but he went with Jairus calmly. There's another story where a woman who was caught in adultery is brought before Jesus by a bunch of men who uh, basically demand that she would be stoned to death because that's what the law would require, that she would be stoned to death. And, and so they're asking Jesus, they're testing him, Jesus, what, what, what do you think, Jesus? Should we, should we stone her to death? And I mean, imagine the storm that is happening within this woman as she's just waiting there and just in fear, trembling, expecting that she's going to be killed that day. And what does Jesus do? It says in the Bible that he just went to the side and just started writing in the dust. He didn't react to the storm. He just took his time. And then after a, a few more leaders asking him, Jesus, come on, we want an answer, he finally comes back up and he just simply says to them, all right, go ahead, but I just want to say whoever, let the person who throws the first stone be the one who has never sinned. And of course, we know that not one of those, person, not one of those guys could throw the stone and they had to just drop the stones and walk away. Jesus didn't allow the storm to dictate a response. Instead, what Jesus does is he allows the storm to serve two purposes in our lives. When you face storms, when you face difficulties in your life, realize that the experience allows you to grow and become mature. I mean, Jesus himself guaranteed that you will have storms in your life. You will have struggles in your lifetime. In John 16, he said, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Jesus guaranteed, you're, you're going to have some trials. You're going to have some struggles in this lifetime. But I love the answer there. He says already at the beginning, but that you, have, you can find your peace in me. There's G, James, the brother of Jesus. He wrote, when troubles of any kind come your way, 
Consider it an opportunity for great joy. Can you believe that? He says, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. And the Apostle Paul, he also writes on this theme about trials. And he says in Romans 5 that we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. For we know they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. I mean, when your life belongs to Jesus, there is a promise that God is at work in your life. He who began a good work in you, he will be faithful to complete it. And so God allows you to face storms so that his work can take place in your life. And the encouragement from, to us from Paul and from James is that we would rejoice when we face these storms. When we know that there's something good that will come through the storm, that is when we are able to hold on to hope. The other response is when we become negative, when we think it's not fair what I'm going through, I, I don't deserve this, that kind of attitude, that kind of response, it leads to discouragement, it leads to despair, and ultimately it leads to a place of bitterness and that will only result in living in defeat. My first experience being on a sailboat was a pretty amazing experience. It was actually last summer in a northern Saskatchewan lake. And I was, it, it was a light breeze. It was sunny. It was warm. And I went out there with a friend of mine who was uh, in, uh, on, in control of the sailboat. He was at the tiller, which is the steering mechanism, and he's holding the rope. And I'm just kind of sitting in the front of the sailboat and just relaxing. And we're going up and down the lake. And it was just wonderful. It was peaceful. It was just a great experience. And so when the opportunity came up again to go out the next day, I was like, yeah, I want to I go out there again and enjoy the water. And the thing is, the wind was a little bit stronger this day, and so we get out there, and we're, it was, it was thr more thrilling of a ride as the waves were, were choppier, and we're going up and down the lake and experiencing a little bit more speed with the wind. And then as we're quite a ways down the lake, he turns to me and he asks, hey, uh, do you want to try, try steering this? And I'm like, oh, of course I do. I want to give this a shot. And so I get in the, in, the, in the back. He gets up to the front, and I'm controlling the, the steering. I'm holding on to the rope and navigating the turns, going back and forth, up and down the lake. And then all of a sudden, there was a strong gust of wind that came in, and it hit the sail really hard, and it just pulled the boat right over the front of the nose, went right into the water, and the boat just capsized instantly. Just in a moment, I'm in the water, and I just can't believe what just happened. I, mean, I was a little terrified. I thought I just wrecked the boat. I thought we were going to have to swim all the way back into the shore. We're halfway down in the lake. But my friend, he's all calm, and he's just like, hey, no big deal. Let's, we're, I'll show you. We're going to get this boat back up. And it was, it was a good experience for me to kind of go through this because I was able to learn some good things. I was able to learn how to get, get the boat back up. I was able to have a greater understanding of how to handle the wind through, uh, when it's stronger and navigate through the sail. It was a good experience for me. And, and the other part, too, was my friend, I, because I was a little bit frantic throughout the whole situation. My, my friend, he was calm. He had experienced this before. He had experienced this a number of times, actually. And so it was no big deal for him. He had, he had grown through this experience, and so he was able to be calm and help me through the experience, even though I was a little bit frustrated and, and frantic through that time. But he, was, he had grown through this. He had matured in the, the activity of sailboating, and it was a good experience for me. But the also, what I, I noticed was in that moment when the boat just flipped over, and in, in an instant, I was in the water, my Ray-Ban sunglasses sinking to the bottom of the lake. I, I was terrified in that moment. I was just freaked out. And the reason why was because I had no control over the situation. I, I couldn't do anything about it. The storm reminds us that we are not in control. 
God allows storms in our lives to remind us we are not in control. The experience helps you focus on the one who is greater than the storm. In the first storm account that we read in Mark, the disciples, they were trying to do everything on their own while Jesus was sleeping. And then they finally went to Jesus. They woke him up because they were afraid that they were going to drown. There was nothing they could do. And so they wake up Jesus. And I, I know firsthand that when everything seems to be going good, when, when I'm comfortable, it's pretty easy to think that I can handle life on my own. I mean, I know that Jesus is there, but when I'm comfortable, I, I get the sensation that, like, I don't, I don't need to go to Jesus and ask for help. I've got this. I can handle this on my own. It, it's pretty easy to get distracted on focusing on Jesus when I'm comfortable. That's what I've experienced in my own life. Even when a mild storm comes in, I often ask the question, well, do I need to go to Jesus? I mean, I've been doing pretty good so far. Why, why should I bother him right now? I can handle this on my own. I, when I read through the disciples' response, it's, I guess I have to take a hard look into my own life and realize I, I'm no different than them because oftentimes I only go to Jesus when I feel like I'm drowning. When I feel like there's nothing else I can do, I got, okay, Jesus, now it's your turn. When I was 11 years old, I, was, uh, I had a paper route that I delivered every day after school. And uh, the routine was I had to go home after school, get on my BMX bike, grab my big paper bag and get to the paper box and load up my paper bag with all these papers. And then I would bike around the neighborhood delivering these papers. And the last house that I had to deliver to was at, I was on, the, on a dead-end road, and so I'd have to bike down, almost down to the very end of the dead-end road, and then I'd have to turn and go down this long driveway, and I would get to the mailbox to deliver the paper. And there at the mailbox, or close to the mailbox, was the meanest, crankiest German shepherd I've ever met. And uh, I don't know, there was, there's, there's, a, there's a relationship between people that do mail and, and dogs. I don't know why there has to be this, this uh, tenseful relationship. But this, this German shepherd was nasty. And her name was Sheba. That, doesn't, that just strikes, you know, the, the, the chills down your spine, right? Let me say that one more time. Her name is Sheba. Okay, and so uh, Sheba, I don't think Sheba liked me very much. In fact, I know she didn't like me because I would come to the mailbox and she would have this regular routine every single time when she would snarl at me, she would growl, she would bark, and then she would get up and be all intimidated. And she was a big German shepherd. And then she would start coming towards me with her sharp teeth. And, uh, and then she would start even running towards me. And it was a, it was a fearful moment every time I, I did this, but it was also a moment of delight because she would run to the end of her chain, and you know how sometimes the dogs would get that jerking part, right? And then, so she'd run to the end of her chain and get irked back, and, and I was always relieved that uh, she was on that chain. Well, there was one day I was uh, delivering the paper, and I get the same routine, I get down there and I mean, hey Sheba, and then she's you know, growling and barking and all that kind of stuff. But there was something different this day about Sheba and uh, about the whole experience because, and I really noticed the difference when she had come further than ever before and then I noticed that her chain wasn't on. And so I hopped back on my bike and I pedaled out as hard as I could, as hard as my 11-year-old legs could, out of that driveway, started going down the street. And I remember I turned around and I could see Sheba's mouth just open wider, just watering to get a taste of sirloin steak, which was going to be coming out of my rear end. And I'm thinking, what am I going to do? And the only thing I could do was say, and I shouted out, and I, I'm sure it echoed across the valley. I shouted out, Jesus! That's that. And all of a sudden, I had this confidence. I, I, I don't know what happened, but I jumped off my bike, and I got it in between me and Sheba. And maybe I, it could have been because of the, the sudden change of events, or it could have been because there was angels behind me. I don't know what happened, but Sheba just stopped. She was just shocked. And then she calmed down. She turned around, and she ended up going back home. 
I mean, I almost had a heart attack at 11 years old. It was devastating. I was terrified. But storms, these kind of situations where we're out of, we have no control, where there's nobody, it feels like we're drowning. These situations show us how little we really are. And it also reveals, though, that there is someone who is greater that we can call out to. I mean, the reality is every day we live our lives, the good days, the difficult days, each day that we might face trials, they would all be completely different. They would all have a completely different perspective if we didn't lose sight of the one who is greater. But after each storm scenario, Jesus said to his disciples something along the lines of, hey guys, why are you afraid? Do you still not have faith? Why do you doubt me? And it, it's really, it's Jesus acknowledging that the disciples had some room for their faith to grow. But there's more to this because in the same account when, when Jesus is sleeping in the boat, if we read that in the Gospel of Luke, Luke ends it off with a, different, with a similar question, but a little bit more clearer. After Jesus calms the water, he asks the disciples, where is your faith? I mean, he's asking them, are you, are you going to trust in yourselves and your hard work? Are, are you going to put your faith in your abilities, uh, your, your man-made items, your, your oars, your boat? Or are you going to put your faith in me? Because when you put your faith in me, I will show you that you don't even need a boat to get through the storm. Where is your faith? And Jesus says, don't be afraid. Take, take courage. I am here. Every day, every situation, I am with you. I mean, this statement, when you read it in the Gospel of Mark, when he says, I am here, as he's walking on the water, it's, when you read it uh, in, in, in there's a commentary in my Bible that when Mark writes this statement that I am here, that it could have been written, I am is here. And this is significant because it's, it's a reference to God speaking to Moses, revealing who he is, revealing his identity, his name. He is the great I am the term Yahweh. And what Mark is doing here is he's, he's intending his readers to identify Jesus as the Lord, the great I am. And when, what Jesus says here to the disciples, it reminds me of a promise to God's people in Isaiah 43, where we have this promise as God's people. Don't be afraid. I've redeemed you. I've called your name your mind. When you're in over your head, I'll be with you. When you're in rough waters, you will not go down. When you're between a rock and a hard place, it won't be a dead end because I am God. I mean, we have an incredible confidence that the one who is greater than the storm is with us. And storms help us to see that. You know, the reality is I, I can't guarantee that Jesus will deal with the storm the way that you hope he will. But I can guarantee that as you trust him, as you look to him, that he will do what is good. Because we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose for them. And I can also guarantee that as you trust him, you will experience his peace. I mean, so often in, in the storm, we are working away at the oars, trying to, to navigate and, and get through it all by ourselves. But when you look to Jesus, you will experience peace through the storm. Author, pastor, author and pastor Timothy Keller 
he shares, putting your faith in Christ is not about trying harder. It means transferring our trust away from ourselves and resting in him. I just, I like the word rest. Maybe it's just because I'm getting old, but I just like that word rest. In the book of Hebrews, we read about an incredible hope that we have when we trust in Jesus. And, and the, the writer, he uses the image of an anchor, which is it's another anchor of being in, uh, sorry, another analogy regarding being in the boat. But he writes, this hope we have is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. Now, I don't know a lot about sailing other than my experience that I had last summer. But I know what the anchor is meant for. The, the anchor is, is meant to, to keep you grounded. It's, it's to hold you down. And I was thinking through this verse, and I was just taking some time just to pray on this verse, and, and God brought the image to my mind of how often I, I, I'm tied to the anchor, right? I'm, I'm tied to the anchor, but I'm still holding on to it. And if you've ever been in a boat and you have the anchor in your hands, you know that that anchor is not doing anything. You need to let that anchor go. You need to let the anchor go deep so that it can do what it was meant to do, so that it can hold you down. That's, that's the only way the anchor can fully work. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Timothy 1 that he makes it pretty clear that it is Jesus who is our hope. And so when you're tied to that hope and you allow that anchor to be let, you let that anchor go, you're allowing Jesus to go deep into your heart to instill the peace that only he can instill. You're no longer trying to keep things in control. I'm thinking of the disciples. I mean, they believed in Jesus, yet they're still trying to do everything on their own. And then they finally realized they can't. They can't do it. And so then they go to Jesus. Often, I, I just need to remind myself, I need to let that anchor go when I'm in the storm. I'm tied to the anchor, but I need to let it go to instill that peace in my heart as I encounter, as I endure through the storm. And of course, during that time, that's when we seek Jesus. That's when we seek his will, not our will, but we seek his will to be done in our lives as we encounter the storm. Where is Jesus in the storm? I want to encourage you that Jesus is right there with you because he is your hope. If you've tied yourself to that anchor, to that hope, he is with you and he wants to instill peace into your heart. I came across, I was listening to a song this week and it, as I was driving, and, and it's a song I've heard a few times. It's a song by a guy named Zach Williams. And it's, the title of the song is There Was Jesus. And I just wanna just read a few lines of the lyrics. It says, every time I try to make it on my own, every time I try to stand and start to fall, and all those lonely roads that I've traveled on, there was Jesus. When the life I built came crashing to the ground, when the, the friends I had were nowhere to be found, I, I couldn't see it then, but I can see it now. There was Jesus. In the waiting, in the searching, in, in the healing and the hurting, like, like a blessing buried in the broken pieces, every minute, every moment where I've been and where I'm going, even when I didn't know it or I couldn't see it, there was Jesus. When I think of the storms that I face, the, the moments of despair, moments of loneliness and, and depression, I'm thinking of financial storms that I encountered, broken relationships, storms in the workplace, wrestling through direction for my life, the loss of a loved one, all these different storms that I encountered. When I when I look back, 
I realized that I was not alone in these storms. Jesus was with me. The great I am is here. Tonight, maybe you've come into this place and I don't know if you knew that this was the, the theme of the, the talk tonight, Jesus in the storm. But I don't think that it's just by coincidence that you're here. I believe that God wants to speak to you. Because the reality is that we all face storms, we all face trials, we all face difficulties in this life. And maybe right now you're going through a storm and you just, you feel like you're drowning. I just want to speak encouragement to your heart right now. The great I am is right there with you. I'm just going to invite you just to, to close your eyes right now in this moment. Just consider the storm that you're, you're facing. Again, whether it be a financial storm, whether it be a relational storm, whether it be a sickness, whatever it might be, it's a storm that you're facing. And I just wanna, I wanna say that when I'm saying that Jesus didn't seem too concerned about the storm, that doesn't mean he's not concerned about you. He is concerned about you. But he is so much greater than the storm. So why should he be concerned about the storm? He's allowing the storm it's an opportunity to see growth and maturity in your life. It's an opportunity for him to, for you to, to grow in a way that you can be encouragement to others who might face a similar storm down the road. But he's also using the, allowing the storm to, for you to put your focus back on him. It's an opportunity for you to say, I need you, Jesus, and I know that you are greater than the storm. And even as I was just sharing about the anchor, maybe, maybe you can relate to that image of holding on to the anchor. And it's still, I mean, you're not experiencing peace in your heart right now as you go through that storm or the storm that you might be facing. I just wanna encourage you you're tied to that anchor, you can let it go deep to instill the peace in your heart because that is what Jesus wants to do. Let the anchor go deep. As we read through the storm encounters in the Gospel of Matthew, he writes that as Jesus calmed the water and at the end of the storm, that the, the disciples' response was worship. They worshiped him. And so in the middle of the storm, whatever situation you might be in, I just wanna encourage you, a wonderful way to Put your focus back on Jesus is to worship him. And so we're gonna sing this, this song tonight called Yes I Will, and it's relevant in the, in, the, in the way that as no matter what situation we might be facing, that we will still choose to worship him, to lift up Jesus, to put our focus on him because he is greater than the storm. And so Jesus, Tonight, you know every situation here. You know every individual, what they're facing. And God, I just pray that you would just begin to speak to their hearts. God, for those that are right now just encountering this storm and they're feeling that they're drowning, God, I pray that you would encourage them and let them know that you are there with them. You have not given up on them. And tonight, God, that they would just be encouraged and to respond and worship to you. And God, I just pray that as we continue to live our lives, God, that we would live in a manner that we would not lose hope, that we would keep ourselves tied to this anchor. 
because you are that anchor. You are our hope. And so we thank you, Holy Spirit, for the work that you're doing right now in this place. In Jesus' name. Let's all stand together as we sing this song. earlier that we're so glad that you are able to be here tonight 
uh, one of the things that we've been thinking about was the idea of going from observer and spectator to participant. And uh, just encourage you, welcome you tonight. Perhaps you want to talk to somebody about what that might even look like in your faith or your understanding of who Jesus is. To move from maybe somebody who's just been thinking about Jesus more in an abstract way and to actually meet him and encounter him. And uh, we'd be happy to lead you in a prayer and talk to you about what that means. Maybe even uh, others here tonight would like someone just to pray with you. Maybe there's a, a, you can relate to this metaphor, this picture of being in a storm. And we have some of our prayer team people who are be up front tonight. And they'd be happy to just take a couple minutes and pray with you also. Uh, maybe there's just some things going on in your heart and in your life, and you're needing some strength, some encouragement, some direction. And uh, it would be our pleasure to be able to uh, take a couple minutes and, and just visit with you and pray with you and minister to you. And uh, the rest of us, we're going to hang out for a bit. Coffee shop's going to be open. And uh, just a reminder, we've got the Student Lounge Monday, Tuesday. We have our Connect group on Tuesday night. Saturday, the Collective is meeting downtown for pizza at Antico. And and you can find the, the poster board with the link for the collective community on the, in the coffee shop area on the big uh, poster board there. And uh, make sure you scan that on your way out if you're not connected to that. It's been a great night to be together. Go and uh, have a great week ahead. We hope to see you throughout the week or next Sunday night. And uh, bless you tonight.